Welcome back to Killer Fun, where we explore the intersection of crime and entertainment every other week. I'm Christy. And I'm Jackie. And we're so glad that you're back with us today. Today, we are talking about In the Dark. How do you solve a murder when you're blind? The same way anyone does, with tenacity. (laughs) She does have tenacity. (laughs) Okay, so I'm going to take a guess and say that you liked this show. I did. Because, I, okay. I did. I lo- okay. a lot. A lot. A lot. Uh-huh. A yeah. lot. Okay. And the reason I know that is because we're only talking about the first episode, boringly named Pilot, today. <laughs> <laughs> but I know, you sent like, me, give it a name. I give mean, it a really, name. like, just give it some kind of name. Whatever. But you sent me a picture of your brand new puppy, who's adorable, and we may to hear from at some point we may because she's in my lap as we speak (laughs) Uh uh-huh exactly (laughs) because uh you know covid's forcing us to once again do some virtual recording whatever man but you know what even if we were in person i think we would still have a puppy i i mean i because for real she's so young she's only nine weeks and and so she's like a little baby so uh-huh yep. she is a baby but she's such a well-behaved baby she is a good baby so cute and oh my goodness anyway this isn't a podcast about your dog this is about <laughs> in the dark so you liked it i did i really liked it i did not know about that actress beforehand i was not familiar no. with her Mm-mm. And so not only is the whole show great and I'm totally enthralled and have continued to binge it, but I am a big fan of her now. Yes. I love her. Yeah, she's not blind, but she does a pretty convincing job of behaving like she is. Yeah, she does. Yeah. I mean, overall, like everything about her. I don't know. Like, I'm just a big fan. Like, I love her now. Like, why Mm -hmm. didn't I watch anything with her before? I don't know. I missed out. She's just great. she there's she started out her career. Well, let's just talk about the cast. Perry Mason plays. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Perry Matfield plays Murphy Mason. She says that it's interesting. The actress and the the character both have sort of androgynous names. Oh, that's true, I guess. Yeah. Which I thought was kind of interesting. Perry Matfield plays Murphy, and she started her career as a dancer. She was a ballet dancer, I believe. So she you did can tell. that. Yeah. Well, yeah, tall and willowy and gorgeous mm-hmm. and moves very smoothly, even, even in a way that's convincing as somebody who doesn't move smoothly through the world. Right. Yeah. There's an elegance yeah. to it, which is uh-huh. very interesting. The juxtaposition of her elegance and her character and all of that, how it fits together is just, yeah. It works really so good. well. Mm-hmm. It works so well because her character didn't wasn't blind at birth and didn't go blind as a young child. And there's, I think that conveys it really well. Like there's a smoothness right. of somebody who used to be able to see the world, but now has a, I want to say jerkiness, but... A, maybe lack of confidence of somebody who no longer does. Right. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. She was in Shameless and the Wizards of Waverly Place, which my kids watched on occasion when they were little. So she looked familiar, but not super familiar. And I'm like, oh, well, that makes sense. Yeah. I had never watched any of those. So I was unfamiliar. Yeah. And then uh, Rich Summer is Dean, the cop. He had a bit part in The Office, which is probably one of the things I recognize him from the most because I've watched The Office so many times. So many times. I mean, so many times. Um, But the big thing he was in, he was Harry Crane in Mad Men. He was in over 90 episodes of Mad Men. So, okay. Yeah. So that's really where he looks familiar. And I'm like, it's one of those, it's been long enough since I've seen Mad Men that... I couldn't quite place him, but I knew mm. I'd seen him in something. I've seen him in something really regular. What is it? Uh, we have Brooke Markham plays Jessie. Um, she's been in several TV shows, but none that I've seen. She was a completely new face to me. Me too. Uh, yeah. Keston John was Darnell, and he was in several episodes of The Good Place, which is probably where I recognized him from. And um, he's going to be in... It's listed in the IMDb, all of the upcoming Avatar sequels. 
Oh, interesting. Yeah. So That's big. we'll probably be seeing a lot more of him relatively soon. Mm-hmm. Morgan Krantz plays Felix. He was in lots of TV and what I recognized him from was a show called Switched at Birth that used to be on ABC Family. Okay. It was like five seasons long and there's like two kids who are switched at birth and they end up meeting one another and it's how their families interact. The first like four seasons of it were really great and the last season was terrible. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it was a cute show and he was in that. I love his character. Uh, yes. He's such a likable, unlikable person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I don't know Felix. how else to describe it i mean no he's I, annoying but still kind of likable yeah but you can see how he and murphy might not get along yeah i want him to win though because he's putting in all the effort he really yes. is and so i just i want him to have big wins and yet <laughs> oh about the water cooler is about it he was able to yeah. lift the new water in some in one of the episodes he was able to yes. replace the big water jug and that was his like big triumphant moment and i was happy for him but that's yes. that's you know exactly then we have uh famila mumpumwana who plays tyson um he's had lots of small parts but he's a pretty young actor so yeah. he hasn't had a lot of time to have a whole lot of parts but he did have a pretty significant part in voiceover work for the animated show Peg and Cat, oh. which I think was on PBS. And it was one of those that my kids were just, a, they were, my youngest was aging out of that kind of show when that one started, but it's really cute. Is it cute? It's really, it's like one of those, you know, how sometimes there would be the shows and you'd be like, oh, this is cute. I want to watch this one. Yes. Like it's I definitely had my preferences. Uh huh. You know. Like Peg and Cat, yes. Caillou, no. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> then there's Derek Webster, who plays Murphy's dad, Hank. He's had lots of TV roles NCIS, Star Trek, Ray Donovan, something called 911 Lone Star with Rob Lowe about firefighters, which I was like, wow. <sighs> yeah, that, I, I know that. I don't know Do that. Do you? I, I know something about that that is not going to be helpful in this moment. Okay. Continue. <laughs> okay. I guess it's set in Austin, so it's relative, to, like, geographically to us. Oh, okay. That that cued more information. Good. Um, so I think I heard about it for the uh, auditions. Oh, okay. That would make sense. It I was a big deal was, here in the uh, film though, Well, then it must, maybe it was filmed in Austin, too. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. It was supposed oh, to be filmed cool. in, in Texas. Cool. So, yeah. That's what that was. Then we have Kathleen York plays uh, Murphy's mom, Joy. She's had a really long career. She's very familiar face. Mm -hmm. um, she started way back in 1984 with her career, which good for her. And she had a pretty great stint on the West Wing which is probably mm -hmm. her biggest thing. Then we have uh, Callie Walton, uh, who plays Chloe, Dean's daughter. And she is an actress. This is her big break. And she is actually blind. She's a little uh, okay. older than the character she plays in the show. But she and she thought she was going to have to give up her dream of being an actress. And then the show came along. She lost her vision like her senior year in high school. And the following year, she's 19. She played this, you know, 13, 14 year old in this show. Aww. And she looks was, so young. Yeah. Yeah. She I mean, I know they really... do the makeup and I know they do all the things, but th she really does. Well, look there's young. some things you can't fake. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And she does have a very young look about her, but. I thought it was really cool. And then there's one more actor who got their uh, big break in this show. And it's Levi who plays Pretzel the dog. Oh, I love Pretzel the dog. Uh -huh. Yes, very, very cute. I read an article about how the hardest part was uh, suppressing Levi's natural happiness. He's just like the happiest dog ever. And they had to figure out how to suppress it enough so that he could be convincing as a guide dog. 
I'm like, mm, it's like those stories you hear about dogs that are supposed to be wolves or threatening in some way Mm -hmm. and they do such a good job acting and they know they're doing a good job acting and they're so happy they have to cgi out their wagging tails (laughs) it makes me so happy it's so so happy Mm -hmm. all right are we ready to recap all right let's do it all right murphy is blind and reckless and selfish and fiercely tenacious She, quote unquote, works at the guide dog organization that her parents founded and lives with her longtime friend, Jessie, who dotes on her Uh, every evening, spends time drinking at a local bar, having indiscriminate sex and visiting with a very young and charming Tyson in the alleyway where he sells drugs. It's in this alleyway that Murphy finds Tyson's body, the same alley where Tyson saved Murphy from being beaten to death after being mugged. The police take too long to show up. The body is gone before they arrive, leading them to believe that the troubled girl is mistaken. Even Darnell, Tyson's cousin and boss, doesn't believe Murphy about Tyson's murder. Murphy dives into finding out what happened to her friend and finds more than she bargained for. Nice. So reviews on this, pretty mixed. I, You know what? I wondered if they would be kind of mixed. Mm-hmm. Louisa Malore of Den of Geek thought the actors did a really good job. Good actors like these can only do so much with muddled, unsatisfying plots and thin characterizations. Mm. Like, eh, okay. Uh, Rob Owen of the Pittsburgh Gazette says, it's welcome to see a blind person who's not a saint. Mm-hmm. which is That's also true yeah. very often people with disabilities are a side character or something somebody either perfect or really unimportant to the story in a lot of ways so it's kind of nice uh joyce slatten of common sense media says sex booze and smoking in an appealing but uneven dramedy so uneven yeah that's uneven. that's an interesting term mm-hmm. that catches my attention. Yeah, like I want to know more about that. Like why mm-hmm. why uneven? Yeah, well, I think the story kind of lurches a little bit in some places. It's not, but I mean that's the way murder investigations, yeah. particularly those not being run by the police, generally well, happen. Yeah, <laughs> I just it's just such an interesting term. Like it could apply to so many different aspects of the show, and but it strikes me as being spot on. Yeah. But I also can't understand why. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Uh, Mark Paragard of the Boston Herald says he agrees with you about Perry Matfield. Mm-hmm. Matfield delivers a nuanced performance as a woman who has chosen to meet the world with hostility as a calculated defense. No matter how middling the story, she's always worth watching. Yeah, like, absolutely. That's, that's super fair. All right, we're going to take a real quick break and we'll be right back with Is It True? Psychology Break and Real Life. So here's how it works. Christy wrecks her search history. Hey, NSA, we promise it's nothing more nefarious than a podcast. To find out what's true, some of the psychological motivations behind the character's actions and real life applications that relate to our topic. I have no idea what Christy decided to look up. Could be the same thing that captured my curiosity or something I never thought of. Is it true? So Murphy tells a man that she's with at the very beginning of the episode that her dog, which we later find out is her guide dog, is obsessed with her. And this is actually a real phenomenon. Velcro dog. Velcro dog. (laughs) Velcro isn't, dog. Isn't that cute? It's apropos. I mean. Uh-huh. I mean, for real. And I guess if you're going to have a dog that's obsessed with you, having your guide dog be obsessed with you is probably pretty okay. Your guide dog wants to be with you all the time. That's mm-hmm. good. That is good. That is a good thing. But the yeah. episode is funny because it portrays the dog overseeing private moments <laughs> very intently and that can uh-huh. be a little unnerving yeah. yeah but see it wouldn't really bother murphy all that much because she she doesn't see, really it. see it happening anyway 
Well, right, yeah. that's true. Dogs can become Velcro dogs for a number of reasons. Sometimes it's because we have our own behavior. So every time our dog comes up to us, they get pet or they get a treat or they start to learn that being right next to us means they get good things, things that they enjoy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, this is from puppyleaks.com, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) Talking about Velcro dogs. If dogs have a physiological change, such as hearing or vision loss, that can cause them to become more clingy because they're it's scary. It's scary to have that change and you're yeah. familiar and safe. Um, then there's some dogs that are bred that way, that they're either bred to work alongside their owners or they were bred to be lap dogs. Hmm. So they tend to be a little clingier. And then uh, dogs such as German Shepherds and Akitas are very commonly uh, attached to a single person most uh, specifically, which I would say as, as I have a German shepherd mix. True. True. She likes everybody, but she loves me. <laughs> My dog. <laughs> oh, <laughs> speaking, speaking of a menagerie, you have a cat. The, the, yes. And he's, he's decided it's time to talk. Yeah. That's all right. And he might go around screaming. That's like, all right. He screams like all the time. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's a little. Uh, if I didn't know better, I would think your cat was a little deaf. He well, he. I don't know what's wrong, but there's something <laughs> about that. But he is a big cat. He's a Bengal, so he, he can be very soft when he meows, or he can be very loud and like. <laughs> so I think he just. But he has a particular type of scream, and that's why we call him the rooster. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. it sounds like a daggum rooster is mm-hmm. uh, going about the house and wake up. Get up. It's time to hang out. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> and then they go on to talk about how there's a little bit of a difference between a Velcro dog and a dog with separation anxiety. So a Velcro dog is just really wants to be close to you. But if you have to be separated, it's fine. Okay. And dogs with separation anxiety tend to have uh, some panic. Right. When and, their and owner is gone. They have behavioral problems when their owner yeah, is gone. Destroying and, things yeah. and different stuff like that. Yeah. So. So was it really Chicago? No. It didn't look didn't like film. Chicago. No, it didn't. It, it like looked enough like Chicago to be like suspend your disbelief. But it's Toronto. Okay. Yeah. And Corey Kingsbury, who uh, developed the show for the CW, um, said she thought they were going to get to shoot in Chicago. And that's part of the reason why she said it there was because she loves Chicago and wanted to spend time there. And then they ended up doing it in Toronto. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, this might sound very negative, but I felt like the storyline feels like Chicago. OK, this feels like it's really there culturally, like all the things fit. Right. Um, mm-hmm. But it did seem disconnected. The It was I don't know how to say this. The set was a little too elegant oh, for yeah. Chicago. That's and I say that as somebody who doesn't live in Chicago, so don't at me about this. I mean, I'm just <laughs> saying for the storyline and for what I was seeing, there just seems to be a disconnect between the elegance of certain things and what they were trying to portray as this very downtown urban life. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, maybe I'm completely off base. So if you at me, be nice about it. <laughs> be nice about it. Just correct me. Just, you know, in, enlighten me. But yeah. That's what it felt like. So when you say Toronto, I'm like, oh, definitely. Yeah. That's definitely. That, that it looks like Toronto. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. It does. Yeah. So I couldn't find that there is a facility in Chicago that specializes in guide dog training. Because, I mean, I knew that Guiding Hope wasn't an actual facility. Right. wasn't an actual organization. Um, but I l- was wondering if there was a guide dog training facility in Chicago. Not that I could find. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of service training dogs that might um, have guide dog training as part of it, but not specifically. But if you're in Chicago, there is an organization called Second Sense 
that has some helpful information about guide dogs and if they're right for you and they work with people with vision loss and can help you get connected with an organization. There's only 12 guide dog schools in the United States that are accredited by the International Guide Dog Federation. So it's not really that unusual that Chicago might not have one, even though it's a large city. There's just not that many of them. That surprises me. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm legitimately surprised by that one because I think, yeah, I I would have thought there were so many more. You would think that there is that there would be that there's only twelve is seems small, and I believe there is one in San Antonio. Okay, so this this begs a question. Uh huh. This begs a question for me. I guess I always thought that if 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 I were to go blind, my first thought would be like, give me a dog, like. Uh huh. Or train my dog, right? I would, as a sighted person, kind of ignorantly assume that that would be first and foremost. Like, this has to happen. And Mm -hmm. I'm wondering now, based on that, the demand can't be that high. So maybe it seems like most people may not choose to have an animal. Um, I think it's actually a fairly small amount of people. So this this article from Second Sense talks about what you need to consider. So you have to be really committed to taking full responsibility for your dog's well-being. You have to be physically capable of walking. Mm -hmm. So you can't, if you're confined to a wheelchair, you can't have a guy, a guide dog. You would have a service dog Okay. because you have to be able to walk a mile. There's a lot of criteria that go into whether you're actually, capable and most of these guide dog organizations that I found all provide the dog and all of the training and travel to and from their facility for the person getting the dog all of that's provided for free wow so yeah so they're all nonprofit organizations and they that's they rely on donors to help cover that cost which is large yeah, well, that's in keeping with the storyline of the show mm-hmm. then, because, yeah. you know, that's their whole nonprofit for mm-hmm. providing guide dogs. Right. Yeah. So I don't think it's the biggest way that most people with vision loss find to get around. There are hmm. plenty of people who have them, but there aren't a ton of people who are completely blind with no vision whatsoever. Most people have, um, there's different gradations Mm -hmm. of blindness. So you may, maybe somebody is technically legally blind, but they don't really qualify for a guide dog because they're, they can see enough shapes and different things. Hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Okay. We saw Murphy buying and taking Mondronix emergency contraceptive. Can you get that brand at your local pharmacy? No, no, you cannot. That is that is, a real brand at all? No, that I is not a real so. brand. No, um, the most common actual names are Morning After, Plan B, New Day, My Way, My Choice, these kinds of emergency contraceptives. Though you shouldn't take it the way Murphy did. Uh, no. Because she just uh, took it all the time willy-nilly and to try and not get pregnant instead of using other forms of birth control that would protect her also from STDs and things. Or STIs. I'm sorry. That's STI is the current preferred nomenclature for that. So Yes. But $34, very, very good price for her because uh, <laughs> yeah, most of the thought... time they're like 50 bucks. Right. Because at some point... In the show, she mentions that it's expensive. And I'm Uh thinking, that didn't seem that expensive, actually. (laughs) But okay. Well, I mean, if you figure, you learn later that she's, this is a pretty regular activity for her. So, I mean, once a week at minimum, it seems. It gets expensive when it's like Mm -hmm. that, but price per, not not half bad. So, Oh, yeah, yeah. I looked up the... Cost and so wreck my search history for all this stuff because <laughs> I looked up how much it costs locally and it's like fifty dollars. Yeah, yeah, not not inexpensive. No, 
Do blind people touch faces to understand what a person looks like? Okay, okay. Uh, I'm going to say that uh-huh. I'm going to say that I thought that was accurate. Okay. Am I that, am I right? Yes, you are. So Murphy does says she doesn't touch faces and that is the most common reaction from people who are blind. So, there is a great article on disabilitywisdom.com from a consultant named Dr. Ariel Silverman. And she she says that you, you see it a lot in media, that people touching faces, blind people touching faces to quote unquote, learn what somebody looks like. And that she says, in truth, I have yet to meet a blind person who habitually touches faces. This act is not only social; it's not only not socially sanctioned, but it usually provides little useful information. Okay. Yeah. Like okay. it's not even like it's really unhygienic, right? For for everybody, because the blind person has touched the face. You're touching the face of somebody you don't know if they sneezed or it's gross and that they're she said she's more likely to recognize somebody from their voice Mm, okay rather than touching a face which would be weird to walk up to somebody you don't know and be like hey do i know you let me touch all over your face kind of right (laughs) and she said not really even by perfume either mainly because people change that they don't always wear the same one and Mostly, she's going to get information that we would get from facial expressions or pauses. She's going to get that from vocal cues. If you're going to pause or the way you speak or if you hesitate, stuff like that, that gives her as much information as if you had, uh, she could see your expression on your face. That makes so much sense. Um, And because that's true for everyone. We just don't typically pay attention to it. We typically rely on the visual body language. Right. And the expressions. But um, I actually find myself very interested in people's vocal tones and pauses and hesitancies. And maybe that's because I'm a musician. So mm-hmm. I, I care oh, about yeah. rhythm. And and so I use very frou-frou terms sometimes with my band when they could be playing something right and it just sounds awful. You know, because there's just a certain energy. There's a there's a lack of some something to it. And so and usually it's something that's ridiculous. And if you walked in and heard me talking about it, you're like, you don't know music. But it's just beyond the page. It's beyond right. the you know the actual division of the beat. It's the music of it. And so when I listen to people speak, I kind of hear that sometimes. I hear hesitancies and weird um, cues that just kind of hit me like I hear what you said, but it didn't match how you said it. Mm -hmm. And it's subtle, not so much of a, you know, preference, but it's just a subtle, like something's interesting about that. Um, Which probably causes more fights in my marriage than anything. Cause I'm like, I don't believe you. (laughs) You can say this and I'm saying, no, no, you're not used. You're saying that, but you mean the opposite. Cause I'm, I'm hearing it. And sometimes you just got to know, you might be hearing it, but it's not about what they're saying. Okay. Right. Sometimes I might be hesitant because a different thought popped in my head. It makes me sound <laughs> like I'm lying or like, I'm not sure what I want to say, but it really, <laughs> Sorry. So now the dog and cat are fighting. No, they oh, had a little okay. scuffle. That's fine. The cat walked up to the dog and was like, <laughs> Whap. Oh, just out of nowhere. <laughs> it tickles him. Rotten. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, it causes a lot of misunderstandings because when people have a hesitancy or maybe they sound like they're lying or they sound rushed, it could be because of something not related to you, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I think that's a, that's a thing for everybody, but I could imagine if I had lost my sight, how much more that would be confusing even. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. In some ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she also... Uh, Dr. Silverman wanted to remind people that if you're interacting with somebody in a professional capacity and if you're like in a store and you're working with a blind person, you want to make sure that if you have like your badge that has your name on it on your shirt, offer that information to the blind person. Oh, yes. Like, okay. oh, that's really smart. Hi, I'm Christy and I work at, for Walmart. Do you need some help locating something? 
like identify yourself as a employee and what your name right. is, you know, whatever, which I thought, oh, that's smart. And even, you know, if you were in an office setting, hi, I'm Christy and I work for XYZ company, mm-hmm. you know, you know, I'm so glad that you're here with us today. Identify yourself every time you see them so that they can get used to your voice or know who they're talking to. That makes sense. Yeah. So if I go to Chicago, can I visit the Lensmore? Nope. I have to go to Toronto to visit the Lensmore. Oh, man. <laughs> I thought this was going to be one of those, you know, oh, it's there, but it's really this restaurant and da 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 But no, I, I guess they, well, they did film in Toronto. We did cover that. Yeah. I should have seen that one coming. But like the name of the place is like, it, they didn't like change the name for the show. It That's is cool. the Lensmore. They just like... It's not like when we talked about Fargo, Mm -hmm. where, you know, they changed the border crossing to the Lucky Penny. Right. I think that's right. That this, they're just, they're like, no, it's the Lindsmore. We're not going to change the signage. We're not going to rock any of that. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's fine. So Murphy told the police that Tyson lived in Fuller Park. And yes, that is a real place in Chicago. Okay. It's the 37th of Chicago's 77 community areas. It is unfortunately identified as one of the worst areas in the city, which makes sense that Tyson might live there considering his occupation at such a young age. And it's also one of the smallest community areas in Chicago. Well, I thought they did a really good job of setting up the story where, like I said, it did feel like Chicago. It felt like Mm -hmm. those areas. And I also thought they did a really good job of explaining the community and the process and the generational impacts and all Mm -hmm. of that on the story. It wasn't just people making decisions. It was people making decisions in a context, in a place, in a space, in a time. And I thought that was really good. I liked that. What else could Tyson do right. except what he was doing? And he was so super smart. Yes. Right. And um, and it, and that they made that clear. He's so smart. Why are you doing this? It's hard to grapple with. But yeah. what else was he going to do? Right. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. Yeah. It is hard. I mean, it's 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 difficult to overlook the impact that where you live has on how you turn out. Yes. Because you can be super intelligent and some people leave those situations and some people are never able to despite their intelligence level. Well, and it's about compassion. I mean, Mm -hmm. I don't think we get a lot of this in the first episode, but through the, you know, subsequent episodes, you do learn a little bit more about family and such. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes when we think about people who don't get out of those situations, we're really being individualistic about them and what they want as if they don't have family they care for. Their right. decisions aren't about whether they can or can't get out of some place. It's about whether he's going to leave his mama. Right. Right. What I mean, these decisions are made out of actually caring intentions for those around them to stay as part of their family and to contribute and and maybe thinking that if they do that right for long enough, then they can put aside the illegal and the dangerous and mm-hmm. kind of go straight later. And then they realize that's not an option. Right. Um, yeah. Once you're in, it's too, it's too late. Yeah. And so that's just heartbreaking. But I mean, a lot of people don't get out of situations because they're choosing to stay and fight within them. Mm-hmm. And there's something to be said for that. That's brave. And it also just shows how weak we are as a, I'm going to just say it as a nation, we just don't have the right programs to help people who want to do the right thing with their family and maybe do something in their lives that's more productive or at least not illegal or Mm -hmm. whatever. You know what I mean? I mean, we just don't have, we have programs to rescue out, not fix within. Right. (sighs) Hmm. Yeah. And fix within is really, really key. It's really key, but it takes a lot longer. It does. It takes a lot longer and a lot more resources because Mm -hmm. that's saving everybody. It's generational. Yeah. Like it's going to take a hundred years to change certain places. It may take 20 years, 50 years to change others. You know, um, that's a long-term game. And we tend to like to give the short-term band-aids. Well, I mean, when you save 
a kid, it's all very romantic and, you know, uplifting and very exciting, but it's a lot more work to save an entire community. Yeah, a lot. You know, I mean, oh, heartbreaking. So uh, Murphy and Dean talk about Murphy's vision loss because Dean has a child who's blind. So Murphy's vision loss was caused by a real and rare disorder, retinous pigmentosa. Okay, so that was a real thing. It is a real, rare genetic disorder. Wow. So while it's rare, it doesn't seem that rare because it affects about 1 in 4,000 people both in the United States and worldwide, which doesn't seem super rare to me. No, that, that that's a prevalence but rate I wouldn't assign as rare. Rare, no. But I think the idea that you would go completely blind from it is rare. Okay, okay. So there, there is a, it's an inherited disorder and there is a lot of gradation within the severity of the illness. It typically appears in childhood, which we know is what happened for Murphy and that uh, some people retain like their central vision and just have an effect in their visual field. Okay. It depends on the person. It's different for pretty much everybody, but so that's interesting that does it only affect the eyes? Like I know it's retinal something, Mm -hmm. something, but oftentimes when you have a a rare condition like that, Uh it's related to some, other things and you have other kind of symptoms and going on signs in the Mm -hmm. body and that only affects the eyes it seems that way yes wow as far as i can tell yes interesting yeah all of the sources that we use to inform our discussion here on killer fun podcast can be found on our social media join us on facebook at Killer Fun Podcast, exploring the intersection of crime and entertainment. You can find us on Twitter at Killer Fun Pod, or you can send us an email at KillerFunPodcast at gmail.com, and I'd be happy to share a link to whatever information you're looking for. We love to hear from you. You might learn a little something, too. Psychology break. All right, so Murphy has a pattern of self-destructive behavior, and she knows it to the extent that she tells her mother she doesn't care about herself at all. Which I thought, I'm like, boy, that's insightful for somebody because her mom accuses her, so what's it like to not care about anybody but yourself? And she's like, I don't care about myself. Like It was a at great all. moment. <laughs> it was so good. But I'm like, oh, that's really sad, though. It's so hard. Okay, so I just was reading recently, and I have the book. Uh huh. Um, it's the Twelve Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson, and this is a book I'm crawling through. It's the one okay. where I go and like I read a chapter every month or so, um, okay. because I'm also devouring other books in the meantime. But he talks about this principle. Oh, um, okay. Self destructive behavior. Well, yes. And this this idea that we don't care about ourselves and it is mm-hmm. extremely insightful. And the, the title of chapter two or rule two, I should say, is treat yourself like someone you are responsible for helping. And he talks mm-hmm. about this very true trend that people are more likely to fulfill their pets prescriptions and make sure their pets take all of them than they are to actually fill their own prescriptions and finish their own prescriptions. Wow. Yeah. And it's a very interesting thing that we go and it, he takes a lot, you know, a long deep dive into where this comes from and all the wow. way back to garden of Eden. So, I mean, it's not light reading this chapter, but, um, It is true. We tend to care more about others than we do ourselves. Even our selfishness is actually a reflection of our self-hatred many, many times. Oh, isn't that weird? I say weird. Like, I mean, we could, it would just, it's a, it's a whole book's worth of discussion, (laughs) this subject. Oh, I'm not self-destructive like she is, but I do feel what she's saying. Yes. Well, I amen, sister, Mm -hmm. first of all, because I'm way more likely to make sure that my husband or my kids or my dog Mm -hmm. gets the care that they need. And I'm like, I'll be fine. I've been fine always up to this point. 
you do the short term. It's kind of like with the community thing. We do that to ourselves. Uh We give everybody else the long term care and we give ourselves the quick fixes and the band-aids, which often are the self-medication, the, you know, destructive behaviors Mm -hmm. because they're quick, they're easy and whatever. The investment to truly transform. I don't think we think we're worthy of that. There are two reasons people don't set boundaries. Either we think they aren't worth the boundary or we think we're not worth the boundary. Oh. Right. Um, we don't think that we're worth somebody doing that boundary. AKA we're afraid they're going to leave. We're afraid they're, if we set mm. a boundary, we're afraid they're going to cross it and, or they're going to leave and they're going to say no. And it's going to be a pain. And what we think is we're just not worthy of that, of wow. them sticking to it and doing the right thing. It's not really about fear. It's about we don't think we're even worthy of them trying it. You know what I'm saying? And so there, mm-hmm. it all speaks to this very internal existential crisis we are all in as human beings. Wow. Yep. Wow. That's not where I expected that conversation to go. Yeah, that wasn't I encouraging expect, at all, boy, was it? You just like, just to fire that arrow right at me. Go ahead. <laughs> this is what I mean. I know. <laughs> Uh, that was not a fun or encouraging, but it was killer. Oh. <laughs> hey, oh. okay, let me put down the 12 rules for life. This is uh, not something we want to keep talking about right now. Yeah, no, put it put it over there. It's happy over there on the bookshelf. <laughs> it cannot make me cry over there on the bookshelf. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So what else um, you yeah. got? <laughs> <laughs> well, we all have self-destructive behaviors, and it's easy to see some of the most uh, indicative ones in Murphy's behavior. Mm-hmm. So impulsive and risky sexual behavior, overusing drugs and alcohol, alienating or aggressive behavior that pushes people away, avoidance, procrastination, passive aggressiveness... And a uh, risk factor can be for self-destructive behavior is both a symptom of and a potential risk factor is drug and alcohol abuse. Right. So you can be self-destructive because you use alcohol or you can use alcohol as a self-destructive behavior. Hello, cat eat- or snake eating its tail. Yes. Cats don't eat their tails, but snakes well, do. Oh. You know, my cat kind of does, <laughs> which really speaks to the whole situation we had earlier with him and the dog. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that's so true. And that's why with psychology is so hard because we don't have this factor. We can't put the things in categories and just deduce a diagnosis. Uh-huh. We have yeah. things that serve both as diagnoses and as symptoms, as triggers and as results. It's very difficult to parse that all out. Yeah. Um, it's but not we, like algebra where you can just solve for no. X. Well, it's not even like medicine, the rest of medicine. Okay. I, I'm very much a fan of saying there is no mental health and medical. There's just health. Health. Yeah. There's health. And, and so therefore it's all medical, but mm-hmm. the way that we approach medical situations as we know it today with the physical body really does lend itself more so to the way that they diagnose now with, you know, using factors and, and putting things in categories, you know, mm-hmm. um, you know, I come in and I say, Hey, my face hurts and I got post nasal drip and I have a headache and I have malaise and the doctor's going to go, Oh, you have a sinus infection. Like I'm going to uh-huh. take all these symptoms, the, in these signs that you have. And then I'm going to say, you know, boop, de boop uh-huh. equals this, right? right? Mental health doesn't work that way because right. you can have factors that, go in multiple places. So that's why they're divided. But on the other hand, I don't want to divide them. It's all right. It's all health. And so it's yeah. Shout out to the people who have to think about that. Yeah, yes. <laughs> well, and a, another thing that can be a risk factor that Murphy had in her life was childhood trauma, neglect or abandonment. We know she spent some time in the foster care system and uh, social isolation and exclusion which is uh, common among the visually impaired. This article also mentions that self-destructive behavior can be a coping mechanism, mechanism, even if you didn't realize it. Mm -hmm. Like, Oh yeah, that's it. It's you cope with things by using the drugs 
or yep. by drinking the alcohol. Oh, so sad. So what can you do if uh, you see a loved one engaging in self-destructive behavior? And, okay, so this article from WebMD by uh, Leslie Becker Phillips, who's a PhD, it borders a little on something I don't like very much, but she says, you love the person but reject their behaviors, which sounds a little bit like love the sinner, hate the sin. Yeah, it does. But it kind of is, I can see where they're, where she's coming from with this, that it's you detach from them in a little way where you're, so you can be unaffected by their self-destructive behavior. You still love the person, but try and not be affected by their behavior to the extent that it makes you also either their behavior is destructive to you or that you also engage in self-destructive behavior. Right. Yeah. And that's basically the only help that she had. It's so sad. We want to think I mean, that there's some way to just go in and rescue. And, um, you know, there might be little things, loved ones, certain people in close proximity. Like in the show, Jess has more uh-huh. proximity to Murph as her best friend and roommate and has more of an opportunity to speak truth into her life and try to give her opportunities to grow and uh-huh. tell her when she's being out of control or literally rescue her from from something, yes. you know, take uh-huh. care of her. Um, but at the end of the day, Murph has to decide to participate in her own healing. Yes. I mean, really, that's the long and short of it. Sh- yeah. And how, I guess the question for us all is, we can't go in there and rescue. We also need to protect ourselves because it's not healthy for anyone if we all get sucked into the vortex. Uh-huh. But how do we live our lives around those people so that we might pose an invitation for them to get better. Okay. You know, like when we walk away, do we walk away with a kindness and a loving that leaves it as an invitation? You know, this is boundaries. How do we set boundaries well so that others may thrive? Yeah. You know, because yeah. boundaries. Yeah, you don't want to enable. Some, you don't want to enable. If you don't set the boundaries, you're enabling them. Right. But if you walk away hard and be like, forget that, it's abandonment. Right, exactly. You, you know, and so some, and you know so what? Hard. I have to say this: some people are not in your circle enough. T- the boundary situation is different. Like there are people in your orbit that's a little further out, and and you're gonna have to just walk away. And there's not much you can do to pose an invitation. You're not gonna be able to like do a lot because they're just not that close to you. And so right. you, you're, and it kind of might feel like boy, that's just not being a kind person, but really they're just not in your orbit and you just have to accept that and move on. Um, Mm -hmm. Or you might have to make the harder choice to say, no, you can't come in closer orbit. Yeah. And, and that's hard too. But what I'm talking about with the boundaries, like the abandonment versus enabling that's for like loved ones who are very, very close, you know? Right. Uh, Right. Yes. Those are hard things to deal with. All right. And then there was one more thing that I wanted to talk about. So Mm -hmm. Murphy meets Tyson's cousin and boss Darnell in a diner. And even though it's not a date, Darnell tries to order for her. So this is a really big red flag. (laughs) Medium.com has this whole article. Women watch out for this ominous sign at your dinner date. It can be argued that men who choose what their dates eat and drink without first asking them what they prefer play into a wider gender power imbalance in dating. In the cases of some men, it can even be a sign of more dangerous behavior. Oh, yikes. Yeah, yeah. And that, that was pretty ubiquitous, right? Like, I mean... Well, I mean, he asked her if she liked pancakes or flapjacks. I don't remember what he called them. But, and she said yes. She answered affirmatively, but doesn't ask her if that's what she wants. Right. He just like orders for her. And the, so it kind of uh, indicates that he has, a, there's a power imbalance of some kind. Yes. And, yes. And that, that he thinks that he can just order for her and she puts him in his place. Yeah. She's like, yeah, she tells the. <laughs> the uh waitress i no, that's not what i want <laughs> yeah thank you but no i don't want that so, she did she did awesome i, was I thought on her she side. did yeah i thought she did really really well but this article says that controlling what a woman eats implies a desire for dominion over a woman's body and you know what that power dynamic i see that 
to be true in many circumstances because it can mm-hmm. happen in business too. You go yeah. out to a, a business lunch and the person who thinks they're the one in charge orders for the table. And mm-hmm. I'm not talking about like an appetizer to share. Right. Uh, right. Like they just place the orders for whatever. And it does. It makes the, you, them feel like the big boss and or yeah. the big guy or the one who's important. And so I could see that to be true across. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So even though this particular article is talking about it in a romantic sort of mm-hmm. way and how that it can be an issue, even though it may seem chivalrous, it's really not that, uh, really it can happen in any sort of relationship and this was murphy saying no you don't have power over me yeah yeah which was good that's cool yeah all right so real life murphy tells one of the police officers that her senses aren't heightened because of her blindness and really that's true it's their senses aren't heightened but they do tend to pay more attention to the senses that they have Okay, so, so I was I was there with that. I, I uh-huh. when she said that, my first thought was no, they just pay more attention to it. Uh huh. And so yeah. yes, I was good. Yeah. I was on board were, with that. You are absolutely right. That said, the brain structure for people who are born blind or lose vision before they're three years old is at least sometimes different. Mm. So like they've done MRIs looking at people who are sighted normally. They have mm-hmm. regular vision, you know, within the spectrum of regular vision and people who went blind in early childhood or were born that way. And they did find a combined structural, functional and anatomical changes in a brain that are evident in people born with blindness that are not present in the brains of sighted persons. That's very interesting. So it's just, a, you know, the plasticity of the brain. Right. Just develops differently right. because of the different so, sensory inputs. Right. Exactly. Well, like there's the... Uh, I'm sure you've seen the article they've done on the boy who was, he was born. No, he went blind at a young age. He had cancer okay. and he uh, uses clicks like okay. echo. He uses echo location and it's oh. incredible. Like he can walk down the street and not look like he's blind. Other than the fact that like, I think he does not have eyes because that was a big thunder. Sorry. Yeah. It was. Um, he, yeah. He walks down the street, doesn't look like he's blind at all because he has, I don't think he has eyes actually. So that, that's a little bit different, but he'll just walk down the street, click, click, click. Okay. And he can like tell where he is and what's near him. And they've like taken him into uh, different facilities like laboratories and things and put different shaped objects in front of him. And he can like walk around it and click and tell you how tall it is and what shape it is. And he's like, I think this is an edge here and this is an edge here. So I think, or, or, oh, this doesn't seem to have an edge. This seems round. It's incredible. That's radical. Yeah. I mean, Amazing. okay, there was a Criminal Minds episode where the killer uh, used clicks because the little boy used clicks as a blind kid. Oh, so it's interesting. I'm like, oh, maybe they kind of based it off like this dude, except it was much more violent. The kid mm-hmm. used the clicks and then the killer learned the clicks. Oh, it was a whole okay. thing. But a whole I, thing. well, I hope it would be a whole thing because it was a whole episode. So um, <laughs> anyway, I digress. Um, but it's interesting because when you started telling that story, I thought about that episode and I thought, oh, wow, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. I, I wonder if that can even be taught. I, it has to be something innate yeah Uh, i mean i just feel like it does yeah i mean i think and he came up with it on his own so it made sense to him oh okay and i mean it was pretty incredible like he could walk down the street and tell you oh there's a pole there Mm -hmm. i think that's a bush that sounds like a trash can to me oh wait is there something on the ground here oh there's a bike laid down on the ground oh my gosh that's like it was incredible like so amazing So he may have a little bit different of a brain structure. Mm -hmm. So Murphy and Dean's daughter, Chloe, uh, kind of talk about being loners. Oh, yeah. And a lot of people who are suffer from depression are also loners. And that depression is quite a bit more prevalent among the visually impaired. Unfortunately, the visually impaired individuals do. It is a risk factor 
for depression. And they did a study and found that 29% of the patients with visual impairment suffered from pretty debilitating depression. I don't doubt it. No, and it, but it, it, it varies though. The more independence the blind person has, the more able they're, the more they're able to reply, rely on themselves, the better off they are. The more they're forced to depend on other people, either because of their living situation or where they live or um, their degree of blindness, Mm -hmm. the more they're dependent on other people, the more severe their depression is. I could imagine. I, Mm -hmm. you know, watching this, watching anything that talks about disability, especially concerning the senses, right? Um, makes me think a lot. And so, you know, I would never want to lose any of my senses, right? Nobody wants to, Mm -mm. but if I had to lose one, like if I had to go deaf or I had to go blind, right? If I had to experience one of those two conditions, I I have to admit that even as a musician, I think I'm hearing. Yeah. Right. I'd want to be able to see. And then I realized I thought, well, I tried to rationalize it with all these nice thoughts first, you know, like, you know, for instance, you know, I just want to be able to navigate the world a little easier. And I feel like I can do that visually better than I can, like all these kind of rationalize. And then it came down to one thing. I am too vain. (laughs) <laughs> I am too I vain. I want to be able to see to put on the fake eyelashes. Yeah. <laughs> I would feel so crippling insecurity come over me about how I look. Uh-huh. There would be, I could not, I couldn't control it. I couldn't control my image to the world. I couldn't, I mean, OMG, I would literally Aww. give up being able to sing and play music for real. Like all of that, just to Aww. make sure I don't look like a fool going around and I'm like, Ooh, gosh, that just brought up some ugly. I got to deal with, you know, but, and I'm looking at her and I'm like, well, if I was going to be blind, I sure hope I would look like her. Oh, I know. Tall Perfect. and willowy and gorgeous and perfect long hair that just falls. And I mean, uh-huh. she just looks gorgeous no matter how bad she feels. I mean, yeah, no makeup doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Cause so, she's perfect skin and even a mess, even a hot mess. She just still looks great. And I'm like, <laughs> I would not be that elegant hot mess. That no, would not neither. be me. I'd just be a, I'd just be tripping over stuff. It'd be oh, sad. Gosh. Okay. But while we're on the subject, can I bring up something other than, well, in keeping with vanity, but, uh, sure. But not. Okay. Anyways, the young girl, the kid, um, oh, what was her name again? Chloe. Chloe. Thank you. Okay. Mm-hmm. So she has a scar. Or, uh, right. It looks like a scar because it's very wide for even a barber's cut. Like, right. right? Like even, even like a line, it, it right. looks a wider yeah, and than she, a line. The reason that they gave for her blindness was that she was in a car accident. Right. So I assume, yes. So I assumed that this was a scar and she has the, the gems <sighs> yes. on the scar. And I oh, was like, I loved it so much. Genius. Cause you and I have a mutual friend who has a scar very similar. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I, I almost texted her a picture and like, you have to do this. Uh-huh. This is so cute. Yes. Yeah, super it's cool. adorable. Like way to take a, something that could cause you to feel self-conscious about yourself and say, here it is. And it's beautiful. And it's beautiful. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like I want to do that. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I want to. Ha- I want to have jewels in my hair. I do. Well, you know, I, I don't. We don't talk about it much, but I do have a hair disorder. So, uh-huh. you know, I wear lots of hair pieces and stuff to cover, right? Because mm-hmm. I don't really have good hair. Um, you know, the the disorder comes and goes, and um, it's been better, it's been worse, whatever. But you know, there are there are times where I just wish I didn't have to do so much work. Yeah. Um, with it, but seeing what she did with that was very inspiring. Oh, good. It was very inspiring. I might get radical soon, y'all. I, you know what? (laughs) I hope so. I've been telling you for a long time that I love it and I don't care what's going on under there. I love you and I think you're beautiful no matter what. Oh, you're sweet. Thank you. Anyway. All right. Now that that love fest (laughs) is over, let's talk about how Hank, Murphy's dad, never forced Murphy to say, I love you. Mm -hmm. In fact, she told him only three times in 20 years and he told her that's enough. Yeah. And I'm like, what a great dad. And that's why Um, she has a good relationship with him and not her mother. Right. Well, I think, I think she and her mother have clashing personalities. They're a little too much alike and 
it's a whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. They're a um, disaster. Yeah. But uh, scarymommy.com has an article, why I don't force my kids to give hugs or say I love you. I want my kids to understand consent. Willingly giving someone a hug or a high five is much different than taking than taking one, even if the hug is not coming from a malicious place. Yep. Agreed. Yep. Yep. Um, and she goes on to say, I don't tell my children or anyone else I love you in order to hear the words repeated back to me. It's nice to hear, especially when you can hear the love coming from someone's voice. Mm-hmm. But love should not have strings attached and should not need to be validated. Not giving or reciprocate, reciprocating affection is not rude, ungrateful, disrespectful, or entitled. And I think that's a hard lesson that we're learning now. Mm-hmm. You know, well, well, growing up, I know it was expected of me to say things and accept hugs or yep. give hugs. And, you know, it's it's a difficult transition for especially for like grandparents and things. Yes, it's Uh, a generational difference. It's definitely cultural, but it's also very American because our greetings uh, that that we have the handshake, Mm -hmm. but that became, okay, I'm going to opine that became such a business thing Uh that I think that it lost what it might have been personally, but it, it, it is a very cold way. And yet there's something about like, for instance, bowing that has a has an intimacy to it, even among acquaintances, you know, Uh Um, or other ways. But I think in America, the hug, certain greetings and whatever, it's going to fall by the wayside. Even in Europe, they're talking about the kiss is is fading away. Yeah, that and and even that could be a little less intrusive than a hug. You know, can I tell you, I'm a little sad about that, because I one of the jobs I had many years ago, Mm -hmm. we had a number of people that would come from Europe Mm -hmm. to to come here for training and different things. And I loved it when they would like lean in and do the double kiss. And it just, it felt so like warm and loving and I I can get now I'm that kind of person. I'm a touchy feely. I love to, you know, hug my friends and things Mm -hmm. like that. And I know not everybody is like that, but it always, it spoke to me in a way Mm -hmm. that, and it was always so non-romantic, which was great. It was also so nice to have that not be intimidating because it was sexual in any way. And it wasn't. Right. Because it's not handsy. Yeah. Like I would prefer that. It does. I don't mind the double kiss. Yeah. Or the single kiss. We live in San Antonio, so more influenced by the right. Mexican and the Hispanic and Latina right. culture. So the single kiss. But, I mean, I would prefer and it's not even, that. It's more like touching cheeks and yes. making a kiss sound. That's right. It's not really kissing, but still in right. COVID days, maybe don't. But. And maybe don't. And that's fine. But the hug and the intimacy that we have, like, in, in America, there seemed to be no balance. You either was, mm-hmm. like, cold as ice um, or because the handshake also is a power dynamic who has the better handshake and whatever yeah. it's a competition. And then or the hug, which is so intimate, wrapped around trapping. And some people it's a little that's that's the moment where it can get creepy. The hands yeah. can do a slow fade off or they could be a little tight, you know, uh-huh. and juggling that has been hard. I mean, we've invented this the side hug, which is equally awkward and weird. So, oh, I mean, I don't know. Yes, I understand that. Uh, CreativeHealthyFamily.com has an article and uh, they have a quote from Irene Vanderzand, who's the co-founder of Kid Power, Teen Power, Full Power International, forcing children to submit to unwanted affection in order to not offend a relative or hurt a friend's feelings. We teach them that their bodies do not really belong to them because they have to push aside their own feelings of what feels right to them. This can lead to children getting sexually abused, teen girls submitting to sexual behavior. So he'll like me and kids enduring bullying because everyone is having fun. That's right. And I'm like, yes, that's where we got, we've got to power our children to say to accept the hug or be able to refuse it and respect that boundary that they set for themselves exactly they are worth the boundary yes for sure joy murphy's mom still attends parents of special needs support groups even though murphy is in her 20s and hasn't lived with them for 
seems quite some time. Mm-hmm. I don't think she's like in her early 20s either because Jess is a full-fledged veterinarian and that takes quite a lot of schooling. Yeah, agree. Yeah. But there are actually, I hadn't thought of this, there are a lot of different kinds of support groups for parents mm-hmm. with children of special needs. And so there's like the emotional support groups where you can talk about how difficult it is sometimes to have and care for Mm -hmm. and love your children who have special needs. Um, There's, you know, financial worries, different things like that, that can be, can be really helpful to have a group focused on that. Then you have your school-based groups. So Mm -hmm. you have common people with a common interest to fight for their children within the school system to uh, that might be a particular group, then you might only have available to you regional groups. So you just, these are the people that are near you. So you have a group that you talk to. Right. There are national groups that can help with these things. So um, like the Easter seals or the ARC Mm -hmm. are national organizations that might have local chapters that can offer uh, services to both parents and children and they are pro- more, a little more able to support uh, for the service organizations that would be around you. So if you need right. help finding services or schools or housing or even employment for your child, these are the kinds mm-hmm. of groups that would help you. And then if you have a specific need, you, an online group might be helpful. So, you know, you're, if you have a child with a specific disorder, you might get together with a group online and talk mm-hmm. about your, the specific disorder. If you're a parent of a special needs child and you're going through a divorce yeah. or particular educational methods that you think would be helpful or being employed, those are the kinds of things you might also want to talk about online with people so that you can get the most uh, sympathetic group who can really understand what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And this is where social media can be helpful. I mean, you know, Facebook has done a a good job with groups, creating groups, allowing groups to exist. And, you know, there's issues. There's always going to be issues, but you can usually find a group for almost any intersection of issues you have. Um, There's only one group that's missing. And and my my son identified that recently. He would like to join a I hate Andy Warhol group. (laughs) Because he has a special disdain for that type of art, of pop art that Andy Warhol does. He can't stand it. He has a ridiculously impassioned response to this for a kid who really Really? doesn't care about art overall. But I digress. Um, And so I made the comment that there's probably a group for that. There's not. Really? Yeah. So somebody out there needs to start a I hate pop art like group. (laughs) which doesn't support anybody but it'd be fun right well exactly well see and that makes sense to me that that particular child would not care for pop art (laughs) i love pop art i think it's awesome i I love seeing the art in like a soup can the yes i mean i thought andy warhol was always very insightful i don't know that it's the type of art that i would want in my home but i love it when i see it out Mm -hmm. in other situations Um, Andy Warhol exhibited the museum. Absolutely. She Sign saw me an up. advertisement. Like he saw an advertisement and was like, just by the way, I'm not going to that. Oh. <laughs> Impassioned response about oh. Andy Warhol. Wow. Well, he can stay home and play with the puppy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So next time we're going to talk about imposters. Uh, some deception as the name indicates and uh (laughs) i think it's gonna be fun there's more than one season of it so it did well enough to get a second season which is always a good sign it's always a good sign (laughs) i'm looking forward to it it's gonna be really good so yeah me too and until next time be safe be kind and wash your hands